And I wanted to really like talk about the evils of the system that I think are taking advantage of, of really all of us, but particularly uh, our black women. I loved your title, Dear White People, because at the time it was such an announcement. And I bet you even yeah. some of them were like, what are you trying to tell me? Well, there was a lot of anger. No matter what race they were, I had people who were very upset about that title. I knew I was gay at a young age. It's not just a thing about me. It's the thing about me. What have you learned about how to dream fearlessly? Oh. Hey, Justin Simeon, thank you for joining me on the show. Thank you so much for having me, man. This is so great. And where are you? Are you in? Uh, are you on the set of one of your movies right now? Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm in what looks like an insurance office right now. Uh, <laughs> but this, this is my office when I'm shooting Dear White People. So we are back for our fourth and final season. Just off camera is a lot of wires and mess and, and very chaotic people. <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be here talking to you. Are you one of those people who love being in production or are you driven crazy by it, but you do it because the thing at the finish line makes you smile? Man, that's a great question. I, I love directing. I love directing. Like once I'm on set and I'm working with the actors and I'm working on the material and I'm picking the shots, love that part. That happens to be about 35% of the job. <laughs> so the running around and the and the fires to put out and the chaos and the, you know, Justin, what color should the socks be? That part, I, I could take a leap, but it comes with the job. So I do it. Cause I really, really, really love the 35% of the time when I'm actually creative and directing. <laughs> and, and is that your superpower? I mean, is that the part that you're best at? Is it is it the script writing? Is it, are you particularly good at casting? Like what, mm. wh where is your magic sauce at this point in your journey? I think for me, it's, it, I'm going to give you kind of an esoteric answer. It's the storytelling part, because that exists in each of the phases, you know, like when I'm casting, when I'm writing, when I'm directing on set, and then when I'm cutting it, when I'm really molding that story, like that's when I'm, my fire is lit. Uh, and so thankfully, there's a lot of that throughout the process, but there's just this logistical side, you know, movie and TV making is so weird. We act like we're writing a book for several months. Then we act like we're on a bunch of photo shoots based on that book. And then we like are montaging the photo shoot. Like it's a very weird, like, you know, segmented process. <laughs> Inspired by the horror classics of the 70s and 80s, Justin's latest project is a throwback about a killer weed. Hey girl. Hey. Did you forget your coat? Yes, I said weed. It is a uniquely black story that hasn't been told in the horror genre until now. So give people the 30 second pitch. Give them the elevator pitch. What is this movie, Bad Hair, and why should I go see it? Tell the people. So it's a movie uh, about a woman who is trying to make it in 1989's, you know, looks obsessed world of, of music entertainment. She wants to be a VJ. Uh, but in order to do that, her new boss, who is played by Vanessa Williams, says that she has to get a weave. So she gets a weave, and as her career begins to blossom, because people can suddenly see her and see how talented she's been this whole time, uh, unfortunately, the weave, as I mentioned before, is sentient, haunted, uh, and needs blood in order to survive. So, uh, you know, it's like it's doing well for her at work, but there's a bit of a body count building up at night. <laughs> <laughs> and so at a certain point, she has to make a choice, you know, uh, between how she wants to live her life. And so is it really a choice if she's told that she has to leave her job, which frankly is a reality for black women in current 2020 year? Is it really a choice if she was going to get fired if she doesn't do it? And I wanted to interrogate that. Um, and I wanted to really like talk about the evils of the system that I think are taking advantage of, of really all of us, but particularly uh, our black women. Did you enjoy making that movie? I mean, I mean, look, it, it's the way my mind works. You know, that, that movie really started with like me kind of laughing about the concept, like, oh gosh, that would make a crazy movie, but just sort of throwing it away. But then it was, it became the idea that like, it kept me up at night because, it, you know, my first thought was like, you can't do that. And then the, uh, this other part of my brain is like, no, but what if you did 
that though, and, and, and maybe you snuck that into it. And, and there was this moment um, really early on when I realized, oh my God, like I would love to make a horror movie. I would love to make a psychological thriller. I've known I wanted to be a filmmaker since I was a kid and I've loved horror movies since I was a kid. Why has it never hit me to make one before? <laughs> Getting to shoot a movie again after two seasons of television was exhilarating because, you know, I was, I'm living the dream. I love my TV show, but it's just a different process. Dear white people, the minimum requirement of black friends needed to not seem racist has just been raised to two. Sorry, but your weed man, Tyrone, does not count. I loved your title, Dear White People, because at the time, it was such an announcement, right? It was, uh, <laughs> I will not be held back. But, but, it, but it was such an announcement. How did people respond to that, Justin? Because, you know, I, even without knowing you, I know you've got a broad and integrated friendship set. And I bet you even yeah. some of them were like, what are you trying to tell me? Do you know what I mean? You know, How did you, what was the response you got from that title? Well, there was a lot of anger, you know. What what I've realized is that Dear White People really is, it's a personal litmus test. However you hear that phrase says something about you and who you would imagine to be saying it. Because I'd have white friends that were like, oh my God, that's amazing. I love it, I'm into it. I'd have black friends that are like, got it, do, say it twice a day, thank you for this movie. But no matter what race they were, I had people who were very upset about that title. I've had, you know, people of color say, well, why are you centering white people in your conversation? But what I found is that, like, it actually is a, it's an interesting way to tell, like, how you, where, just where you're at on race and, and, and how you think black people talk. Because the truth is the words, dear white people, incredibly friendly. What letter doesn't begin with dear? There doesn't have to be an exclamation mark after the dear white people. There could be a comma, you know? It could be a thank you note. Who knows? <laughs> what have you learned about race, particularly since you started, you know, something as profound as Dear White People, which started as a film, became a, uh, uh, became a successful TV series on Netflix? It's not the obvious things um, that actually, that's, that's the way racism most impacts my life. I'm not outrunning a lynch mob per se uh, in my day to day. It's really about the stuff that creeps up in the institutions that lives in our blind spots. The stuff that I feel crazy even saying out loud, but something inside tells me this isn't right. You know, I remember when Obama got elected president and my mom was concerned immediately. I was still in that hope kind of phase. She was like, Justin, they are not gonna do him, right? I was like, no, it's gonna be fine. And then like a week went by and I was like, oh, okay, there's like a whole news report on him wearing a tan suit. Got it, okay, this is, cra this is racism. And so like, you know, having to realize that like so much of racism really does live under the surface. Um, it, it has to be excavated. And that process is not fun. It is painful. It's painful as a person of color. It's going to be painful for white people as they're starting to do it as well. Like, you know, we have to relook at some of these assumptions that we've based a lot of our lives on. And, and that's where the change needs to happen. As a gay man, I, I learned I have to I, I have privileges, too. I still have male privilege. And so when a woman tells me, hey, Justin, like this line in the script, it, it doesn't feel right. I got to step back and not be the writer director. I have to just be a person on this earth learning about someone else's experience. I have to lean in. I have to be more curious about how a person is feeling than I need to be right. I've had to learn that lesson. <laughs> Our home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully, dream fearlessly. Something is going on in Houston. We have only been doing this show for two months and you Houstonians, you are blowing up this <laughs> show from your girl Beyonce to the chief of police, Art Acevedo to William Jackson Harper to, I don't know if you know your girl, Ogi Ubuno, who's uh, an up and coming young filmmaker, but you no. guys are, I feel like you guys are everywhere doing interesting stuff. Did you grow up in Houston the whole way through or did you just get there for high school? No, I, I grew up there. I was born there, born and raised in Houston. And 
You know, there's something in the water. But one thing I noticed about all of us from Houston is we we have this ability to be incredibly intense and focused and this is what I want and exacting. But we're like laid back at the same time. <laughs> and that city is how it felt because it's a big city. It's a bustling city, but we're also in the South. And so like, you know, we somehow know how to go fast and slow. <laughs> what would surprise that young fellow who was at Houston's Magnet School for the Arts back then? So clearly he cared about the arts. He wanted to do something in the arts. But what would surprise him most about your journey, number one? And then number two, if you were giving him a little piece of advice about how to go from here to there, like what would you tell him if you were trying to give him the real real? Not the thing that you're telling thousands of people, but it's just you and young Justin. Like, like what, what would you say to him? I would tell him that your queerness is your superpower and to not be afraid of it and to not wait to get to know that part of yourself. Because when I think about the things that people celebrate on me for, it comes out of that same queer spirit. You know, it's not it's not about sexuality. It's about the fact that, like, as a queer person, I have to integrate and blend things that the rest of the world think don't really go together. You know, I was raised a Catholic. I, I, I was a Christian for a long time. I'm a Buddhist now. And I had to be able to navigate that spiritual path uh, through lots of communities that maybe didn't think that was okay. I had to be a black man and be queer, which is a whole thing that was definitely not being taught. That no one was teaching me how to do that uh, growing up in the South. You know, when you look at my stuff, you're like, why did, where did he come up with that? Why did he think to put those two things together? Well, that's because like, that's how I've, I've lived my entire life. And there's a part of me that understands that there's something special uh, when you put things together that maybe the rest of the world doesn't get what they have to do with each other. And truly, it might feel esoteric, but that is where so much of, you know, uh, my voice as an artist really does come from. It's a wellspring for me. You know, I don't think it feels esoteric at all. It's funny. I was interviewing uh, Lee Daniels, the producer and director, a couple years ago, and it was in that moment with him that I said, we are gonna have an LGBTQ president in the next decade. That similar to you, I felt like there was a superpower in embracing that and that we were entering an era where um, a willingness to be open, to be bold, to be confident, even when other people couldn't be confident in you, a willingness to confront Goliath when you're David, um, yeah. All of those things were going to matter more and actually be more possible in a digital era, right? You got more slingshots to work with. And then I saw, <laughs> you know, Mayor Pete come along. And while he didn't make it, I was not surprised that he did as well as he did. And, and yeah. I was left with the belief that there's yet more to come. And, uh, we're thrilled to see that uh, California seems to be extraordinarily supportive. When did you start, you know, going there and tapping into to your, to your truest self? Well, I, I mean, I knew I was gay at a young age, but I didn't, you know, I, I had different myths in my head about it. I thought maybe it would pass. I thought maybe it was a phase. And when I realized it wasn't, <laughs> you know, it was a thing that I was proud of, but it sort of lived alongside of my life. I think that like what I'm experiencing really recently, I would say like in the past maybe five years or so, is that it's not just a thing about me. It's the thing about me. You know, you talk about that David versus Goliath energy Queer people, we don't really have a choice. It comes forth no matter what. We know I'm attracted to that, or I this feels right, even when the entire world is saying, no, that's not right. And so like, there's this internal need to survive and to fight and to be ourselves um, that just impacts every aspect of my life, especially as an artist. Because even if I'm not even touching upon those themes in a literal way, the energy of that. There's a part of me that gets excited when I'm not supposed to do something. And, and that's where that comes from, I think. After being openly gay in Hollywood and finding success and telling the kinds of stories he wants to tell, Justin told me he feels a lot more grounded in who he is. When you say that you are more yourself today than you were even five years ago, is that just maturation? Is that success? Is that love? Love has a big, a big part to do with it, I have to say. You know, I met my partner of almost seven years right after, I would say, my big break in Sundance with Dear White People. And the other part of it is getting the things that I thought 
were making me unhappy, like breaking into the industry, having a TV show, getting to direct, and having money to pay my bills, uh, being able to buy my mom a house. Doing, accomplishing those things and realizing I was just as freaking miserable as I was before, that was like a, a big aha moment. And, and it was a, a chance to, to recognize and realize that my happiness is not really about what happens on the outside. It, my happiness determines actually what, what comes to me and how, uh, how I can appreciate and, and use those things to my benefit. Um, so that shift was a, a real big one. It was not an easy shift. Um, it took time and it took lots of experiences and lots of difficulties, frankly. I love, Justin, where you're going. And I, I see this village in, enveloping you and or you building it between your crew, uh, between love, uh, between um, experience. Anything interesting about faith, spirituality that's played a role in here? Or while that's important in many people's lives, that hasn't been as central to the journey you've been on? Around the time I moved to Los Angeles, I began meditating. Uh, and eventually that meditation practice gave way to a Buddhist practice. Um, and, you know, for me, it is a practice. It's really not so much about belief systems. Um, it, it's, it's more so about being able to do something regularly that helps just kind of modulate what's going on inside and also embrace all of my dichotomies. And that for me has been a huge, huge, you know, uh, part of my success, I would say. Any failures or shortfalls that you would share with us if we were family that, that maybe we can learn from? Yeah, I, look, I wouldn't take any of it back because it was all necessary for the journey. But I think when I first started in the industry, fresh out of college, I was working um, in a publicity department at Focus Features, answering phones and, you know, having that assistant life. And I was so hard on myself. You know, I, I had, I, 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 I wanted so much more for myself than I was able to achieve. I wanted to get there faster. I wanted to have a fil my first film, you know, in the first year after college. I wanted success. I wanted to get there. I wanted to get there. And as many times as many as people told me, it's about the journey, slow down. I, I just, I wouldn't listen to it. And it, it actually made life kind of hellish. And it made it so that when I did find success, I didn't know how to enjoy it. I didn't know how to sit in it. I didn't know how to receive it when someone said they were really moved by something that I made. I love on this show talking about dreaming fearlessly. I feel like you represent that, you embody that. Not that it's always easy, not that it's straightforward, but that you embody that. What have you learned and what would you share with other people about how to dream fearlessly? Oh, don't edit too soon. Let it be messy. Let it come out in fits and spurts. Let your, uh, give yourself permission to not even know what it's about yet. You know, so the minute you get an idea, we're so conditioned to figure out how to sell the idea, how to market it, how to, how to shape it and mold it so that we can get something out of it. If you just sit back and let that thing come and grow and tell you what it needs to be, the final product, um, product, <laughs> whether it's a product or whether it's just art or whether it's just something that you did for yourself and never show anybody, far more impactful, um, far more moving and maturing as a process in your life. If you let it for inform you um, just a little bit more. And I say you because I I'm learning to do it for myself. <laughs> first time I made a movie, Dear White People, legitimately, legitimately, the first time I felt anything even close to pride was maybe a year or two after I had made the movie. And I, wa I was walking by in my apartment and saw a framed poster on the wall and thought like, oh my God, that was just an idea in my head that like nobody cared about or believed in for years. And now it's done and it's a poster and there there's like, you know, reviews on that poster. And it's like, it, it's, it's just out there in the world as a past tense thing. And it was the first time I felt any pride. Um, and that really was the, a result of, of me just like, ah, you know, so goal focused and oriented um, for the first uh, 10 or so years of my professional life out here in Hollywood. I'm gonna go to what I call my rapid fire, if that's okay. Oh boy, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Give me something you love, what we call it Aussie good Give me some good Oh, some good Okay, um, 
I love Spotify. I know that's a really like, you know, surface thing to say, but they have my algorithm correct, okay? Who do you love to share your work with? Lena Waithe and I met in a writer's room years and years ago. Like, a, it was it was not a real writer's room. It was just... <laughs> She's a person that, you know, sees a lot of my stuff. Have you ever been fired? Oof, no, I've never been fired, no. But I've sure had to tap dance. <laughs> 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 to keep from getting fired. Are you a good business person? I think I'm an okay business person. You know, I think I'm a I'm a great artist. <laughs> I think as a business person, I am catching up considerably. I thank you for making this so great. Thank you for uh, oh, for taking man. the time. It was a jo true joy to talk to you. Matt, I hope you will come back, and I hope in healthier times I get to meet you in person. Yes, that would be amazing. One day we'll hug, we'll shake hands. <laughs> Hey, I hope you enjoyed Justin Simeon. I really did as well. I found him smart, funny, interesting. I love how bold he is. I loved him talking about leaning into those things that are uncomfortable. Uh, I loved him talking about embracing his queerness and that that actually was his superpower. So much good stuff in this conversation. If you haven't started watching his TV show or films, I hope you'll do it. Maybe listen to his podcast as well. Um, but in any case, what a special person. I hope we'll see more of him. Uh, in the meantime, guess what you can do? You can subscribe to this show if you haven't already. You can certainly tell friends. And you should listen to the podcast. In fact, this Justin Simeon podcast, fire as the people say. Give it a shot. I'll see you soon. Hey, tune into The Carlos Watson Show. It's like no other. You're going to enjoy it every weekday on YouTube.